Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And if you're joining us online, we have several people here in house. That's what we're going to call it, in house. So we appreciate you coming. And I have to ask you all an honest question, everybody who's sitting here tonight. How many of you have been following along online throughout this? All right, I'll give you the majority of this series. Would you just raise your hand? Okay, I just need to know who I'm dealing with, okay? Because I've only, in fact, the four or five people that normally are here, none of them are here tonight. So uh, I don't know, I, I don't get to see too often who's online. And so interestingly enough, I just need to know who I'm dealing with, how much, how much I, backstory I need to give you and all of that stuff. So um, hopefully this will be all right. If you haven't been following along, we're in the uh, midst of 1 John. So if you want to turn your Bibles there, that'll get us started anyway. 1 John chapter 5. And again, if you're joining us online, we've started at 6 o'clock. This was our original time. Um, and then we went to, uh, into COVID shutdown. And then uh, Pastor Levi and myself were kind of fighting for the same time slot. And so um, for his teenagers, so he uh, ran at 6 o'clock for upstream teens. And then uh, so I, I switched over to 7 o'clock. And uh, now that we're able to meet physically for a little bit, we are um, going to move us back to 6 o'clock. And I hope it's uh, helped to you, give you a little bit more time in your evening. And if you feel like joining us um, online, or excuse me, in, in person, physically here, we would love to have you and uh, uh, be able to sit socially distanced. And we cl cleaned everything before everybody got here again, so uh, it's an opportunity for you as well. Just a few announcements for you before we begin. Uh, not, not next week, but the week after, we're going to be uh, having our church picnic. So our Sunday night service will be... Um, Across, over, across town at our building, our property out there. We'll be able to have some time out there, and uh, well, that's our revision night. And so we're going to be able to have that. And then the week after that will be our uh, communion service here. And uh, it's going to be an interesting time. We have the prepackaged um, wafers and prepackaged um, juice, and it's going to be interesting, but it'll be a special time, and so I hope you'll join us for that on the 27th as well. That's for our church as well, all right? 1 John chapter 5, and uh, we're getting near the end of 1 John, and I hope you've learned a lot. I hope you've taken the time and learned a lot about this and uh, your relationship with God and knowing him more closely and more intimately, uh, knowing that you know God is an extremely important um, part of your life as a believer. It's an opportunity to show God to the people around you. So knowing God helps you show people um, really God. The Bible says here in 1 John that no man hath seen God at any time. And so we are able to show forth that love in a way that really no one else can do. Uh, in the beginning of 1 John, the Bible talks about uh, walking in the light. And we have a responsibility and the opportunity to walk in the light and to uh, live a life around the light. And when we walk in the light, we are showing the world that we are not walking in darkness. And the Bible says, ye are the light of the world. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Basically, Jesus living through us. So all of these things are about knowing God, and that's the title of our series, and having a close-knit relationship with him. But the more you know about something, the more confidence you have in talking about it, right? The more you know about something, the more confidence you have in talking about it. I used to know a fair amount about farming, and so I would enjoy talking to people about farming. There are other people who knew more than I did, but I enjoyed that. Um, if you know a lot about cars, you're fairly comfortable talking about cars. Um, I'm not sure what ladies talk about, so maybe fashion. I don't know if you're comfortable in fashion, know a lot about fashion. You're comfortable in talking about that. Some, some of you guys are good in technology, and you love technology, and you uh, feel free, and you feel comfortable talking about technology because you've uh, put your mind on those things, and you think about those things, and you talk about it because you know it. Again, all of these things give us a confidence. When I have a great deal of knowledge, I have a great deal of confidence. The same is true when you know someone. When you know someone, you have confidence in your relationship with them. The first time you ever meet someone, I don't know if anybody else is like that. this, but uh, I don't show someone for the very first time every nuanced 
wonderful part of my being. <laughs> I don't show them all of my uh, wonderful uh, expressive parts. I try not to. My, my emotions, I try to hold some of those things, some parts of my personality in because some people just can't handle that on the first round, all right? So we hold that back just a little bit. And, but the longer you know somebody, the more confidence you have around them and the more you can just, we always say, let yourself go. You can let your hair down, so to speak, and you can just be confident in who you are as a person. And I think we're all like that to some extent. So the longer you know someone, the more confidence you have around them. Confidence in a relationship is a wonderful thing, and that's what I think is wonderful about uh, being married for so long and having that wonderful opportunity of having what, what we would call intimacy, not in a sexual way, but even in an in a, uh, emotional way, where we can just be ourselves and be who we, uh, God has created us to be. Confidence in a relationship is a wonderful thing. Here in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14, the Bible says this, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And so this is the confidence. This is the confidence that we have in him. All that John has been talking about is knowing God and being in an abiding relationship with God and knowing love and showing love and all kinds of different things that he's been showing us. And then he says, toward the end of the chapter, this is the confidence that we can have. We can have this confidence. We can have the confidence in a relationship with God. So much so that John says here that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And then in verse 15, it says we have the petitions that we desired of him. So literally, quite literally, almighty God of heaven, we have at our disposal, so to speak. Just for lack of a better term, we have him at our disposal. He is everything to us and he can give us everything. We can have a relationship with him and he will grant to us literally our every request. You're thinking like, I don't know if that's necessarily true. Well, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire. It's, it's like a genie in the bottle. Hey man, we got three wishes three wishes and he'll give us anything we want and it's bibbity bobbity boo you know all that stuff you've heard people say that before haven't you well god will give you anything you desire but even psalm chapter 37 and the rest of the bible begins to talk about this delight thyself also in the lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart again if you've been in church for any amount of time you think something's fishy about this this isn't right. God will give you anything you ask for. I'm going to start asking for millions and millions of dollars then. That way we can have anything we want. That's what the Bible says, right? Well, there's actually a caveat. There's actually a small portion that we sometimes overlook. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14, at toward the end of the verse, if we, verse, if we ask anything according to his will, if we ask anything according to his will, and here in Psalm 37, 4, it says, delight thyself also in the Lord. That's the caveat. Delighting in God, knowing God, understanding God, having a fellowship with him, a relationship with him, that is the caveat. For, so here's an example. If you begin praying God, to God for a million dollars, do you think you're going to get it? Probably not. Not necessarily all in one lump sum because that goes against God's will for my life. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21, an inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. So that doesn't, that, that's not a good thing for me. 
For God to drop a million dollars in my lap and me to pray for that, listen, that's not according to God's will for my life because the end thereof is not blessed. And so you might think, well, I've been asking God for this for so long and he has not answered my prayer. Maybe there's something we're doing wrong. Maybe we're not asking according to his will. Here's what I should be praying for. God, would you provide for my daily needs? God, would you provide for my daily needs? The Lord's prayer, the model prayer that the Lord gives us says, give us this day our daily bread. This is the model, the needs that we have. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so if I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask petition of God and I'm going to have a confidence in God, I have a confidence in asking anything according to his will. I want you to think about this. Because a lot of times we mess this up and we mix this up and we pray things like, God, if it would be your will, would you please allow this to happen? That's not such a bad thing, but here's what I want you to understand. I believe this, when God is my everything, I don't necessarily want earthly, fleshly things. When God is my everything, I don't necessarily want earthly, fleshly things. I don't want a million dollars anymore. I want God. I I don't want uh, a new car that I can drive around and show off to all my friends. I just want God. I don't want this, that, and the other thing. I just want God. I don't want earthly things. I want God. So what happens is your relationship with God literally changes your desires. The majority of us would love to have those things. We would love to have those fleshly things. We would love to have those earthly things. But the more you know God and the more time you spend with God and the closer you get in an abiding relationship with him, your desires literally change. Abraham, the Bible calls him the friend of God. You know what God told him? I am thy exceeding great reward. God was his reward. Listen, we know that Abraham had quite a amount of riches. But it only happened after he gave God his life. And God became his exceeding great reward. Let me put it to you this way. If you want God to answer your prayers, stop looking at yourself and start looking at him. If you want God to answer your prayers, stop looking at yourself and start looking at him. You know, that's how we pray, isn't it? God give me or God help me or God do this or do that or do the other thing. And we look at God oftentimes as a genie in a bottle and so often we've neglected our relationship with God and we pushed it aside and said, I don't care what that has to do. I just want to get what I want to get. You know, Satan doesn't need, an, or excuse me, God doesn't need another Satan. That's exactly what Satan did. Satan had all power other than God himself. He was second in command and he wanted more. He wanted God to give him more. He wanted to overtake God. God doesn't need another one. If you you want God to answer your prayers, stop looking at yourself and start looking at him. Get to know him and let your desire be toward him. Let God change your desire. You say, Pastor Yeomans, what really does that look like? What really does that look like? Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7 is known as the Sermon on the Mount. This is where Jesus sat his disciples down and began to teach them. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, the Bible says this, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Listen, we want to take that, we want to run with that and say, man, uh, I can preach prosperity and wealth, and if I just live right, God's going to bless me abundantly. If I just, you know, come to church on Sundays, give my little bit of tithe, and 
I'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's not what this is saying. Let's continue. Verse 8, for everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you. Do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is the relationship that God is showing, a father-son relationship. Hey, if a father and son have need, and the son says to the father, I need some bread, is the father going to give him a stone? No. If he says, hey, I need some uh, uh, fish, am I going to give him a serpent? No, listen, it's a father-son relationship. There's an excellent relationship here. And so God will supply all your need. God wants to supply your need. God wants to give you things, but God wants you to look at him. God wants you to look at him as your supplier. I remember uh, I've given this illustration several times. I, I wrecked my dad's truck one time. It was terrible. Just completely destroyed the front end of a tree, jumped right out in front of me, and I couldn't do anything about it. It was terrible. I messed up, okay? I hit a tree. I actually did hit a tree. But nonetheless, in that moment, when I took the truck home and my dad saw all the damage, probably not a good time for me to ask my dad for 20 bucks. Probably a good time just to not say anything. Why? Because there was something hindering our relationship. Listen, I, I may have needed 20 bucks. But listen, it's, it's not about just getting what we want out of the deal. It's about having a relationship. And so often we treat God, we wreck his stuff, and we uh, toss his stuff around, and we just uh, do what we want and when we want, and then all of a sudden we need something, and we run to God and say, hey, you said if I ask anything, you would give it to me. And God's saying, hold on your desire is toward me delight thyself also in the lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart this is the confidence we can have this furthers the witness that we can be for him and this enhances and propels our relationship forward i want you to think about a wonderful abiding relationship with god and what a bright light that is to a community to a world surrounding us Listen, I, I don't know how it happens, but God just supplies all my need. What a wonderful testimony. I know there's some that sit in this room and some who attend our church on a regular basis that have seen God just provide and provide and provide and provide. And you know what? They didn't ask to be in the situation they put, were put in. But they've done their best to seek after God and continually look to him. The Bible says when you do that, when you ask according to his will, he will give you the desires of your heart. I want you to go back to 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to bounce around just a little bit tonight, mainly just to keep you awake. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 16. Now, i got to be honest with you. This is, there's a few things in here I struggled with. I don't know, if, again, if I fully have all the answers. I've taken some time to study these things and I hope this will be a help to you. But 1 John chapter 5 and verse 16, the Bible says, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. This is somewhat confusing to me. But this is basically what I understand. Not only do we have the opportunity to ask petitions for ourselves in relationship to God's will, but we have opportunities to ask petitions of other for other people. We have the opportunity to ask things on behalf of other people. In order to understand this verse, I believe we need to first establish what a sin unto death is. What is a sin unto death? Again, if you look down in this verse, if a man, any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. And then in the following part of this verse, it says there is a sin unto death. 
There is a sin unto death. And so what is that? What are we referring to? Well, I want you to go back to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6. This is important. And this will tie in. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6. We'll come back to this verse. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. Here it is, watch. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now hold your finger there. The Spirit beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. In verse 31. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 31. The Bible says this. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. There is one sin that cannot be forgiven, and that is blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 32. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. I can't believe that. It's hard for me to believe that if you speak against Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, it can be forgiven yet. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Watch this. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Whoa. Blasphemy, speaking against the Holy Ghost. Understand, this is the only sin that cannot be forgiven. Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Again, I want you to go back to 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse 6. Just look at the end of verse 6. The Bible says this, And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. What does the Spirit bear witness of? Again, we've talked about this a couple of weeks ago, about the Spirit bearing witness that Jesus Christ was the Son of God in the flesh. And again, notice the Spirit is truth. The Spirit is witness and the Spirit is truth. If you speak against or blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, you know what you're doing. If the Spirit is truth and you're speaking against Him, help me out, you're speaking lies. So you're lying, but what are you lying about? You're lying about what the Spirit is speaking of. The Spirit is a witness. He's a witness of what? That Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. You are quite literally committing the sin of unbelief. You are saying, the Holy Spirit, you are witness. And I am speaking against your witness that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I do not believe you. I believe you're lying. I believe you are unbelief. True. So you are quite literally committing the sin of unbelief. Unbelief is a sin. You know that, right? Unbelief is a sin. You are basically saying, I do not believe the Holy Ghost. That sin cannot be forgiven you because it is that sin that will lead you to death. Is everybody following? Everybody understanding where I'm going with this? If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, as your personal Savior, that is the sin that will keep you from eternal life. All other sin can be forgiven. All other sin can be blotted out except for the sin of unbelief in Jesus Christ. Just not the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. The Bible is very clear about that. And so yes, all sin, the wages of sin is death. There is only one sin that cannot be overcome in this world and cannot be overcome in the world to come or forgiven, excuse me, I should say overcome is probably not the best word because we're going to see that it can be overcome. But it cannot be forgiven, excuse me. So I want to show you this, John chapter 5. I love how the book of 1 John and John give us a little bit of insight into each other. By the way, the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. 
John chapter 5 and verse 24. Watch this now. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, watch this, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed, watch now, from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So are are you following with me? I hope you're understanding what's going on here. There is a sin that is unto death. There is a sin that is not unto death. 1 John chapter 5 is saying, if you see a brother that is in a sin, not unto death, and you ask and make petition for him, God can give him light. God can give him light. Go back there. Bible says in verse 16, Sin which is not not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Lying, cheating, stealing, fornication, lasciviousness. I mean, the, the list could go on and on and on and on. And there are a ton of sins that can be forgiven. There's only one that can be, cannot be. So in fact, there is a sin that is not unto death. And you can pass from death unto life. You can be changed in a moment. God can overcome your unbelief. God can overcome your unbelief. I want to make that very clear because I kind of misspoke before. God can overcome your unbelief. He said, if you will hear my voice, you can have eternal life. If you will hear it, you can see the light. You can hear the witness from God. You can know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I think often we look at the world and we think there's no hope for them. You may live here in St. Thomas, or London, or Elmer or wherever you may live. You might look at your neighbors and co-workers and the city as a whole and go, how are we ever going to do this? How are we ever going to accomplish this task? How are people going to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? I want to encourage you. This is what we have. We have confidence. We have confidence to ask petitions not only for ourselves in the will of God, but to ask petitions for other people in the will of God. The Bible says in 1 Peter, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, where listen, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You want to know there's one thing you can pray all the time that is always in the will of God? For the salvation of someone else. For the repentance of someone else. This is what I want to encourage you with. We can petition God on the behalf of our neighbors who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We can petition God on behalf of our co-workers who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior who do not know that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, we can petition God while they are still alive. Though dead in their sins, they are still alive and can be made alive in Christ. Jesus can give them the victory. Jesus can lift them out of that. He can give them victory. But the Bible doesn't stop there because there's the end of this verse. It says there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. I mean, again, I could interpret this wrong and I could look at this differently, but it seems to me that he says there's no sense in praying for that. There's no sense in praying for the sin of unbelief. So you're saying, Pastor Yeomans, you can't pray for people who are in unbelief. That's not what I'm saying. 
What I am saying is once they're gone, once they've passed from this world and they've made the choice to not believe, they've made the choice to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, they've made the choice, they've committed the unpardonable sin as we call it, and that's a prayer that cannot be answered. In fact, the wise man, or the rich man, excuse me, I'm having a rough time tonight, the rich man and Lazarus, remember that story? A rich man ends up going to hell, and what does he say? I pray you, just let Lazarus come and touch the tip of his finger in water and let it cool my tongue. And God says, no, it cannot be done. Listen, once you're gone, once you are in eternal hell, there's no getting out. There's no getting out. Let me challenge you tonight to pray. Let me challenge you tonight to pray for your neighbor. Let me challenge you tonight to pray for your coworker. Let me challenge you tonight to pray for your family member. Let me challenge you tonight to pray, 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 beg God on their behalf. They have, they're still here. They have not gone. They have not committed the unpardonable sin. They can still have life. Pray. We can have confidence before God. We can come boldly before his throne and before his throne of mercy and ask into his presence and say, God, I'm lifting up in your presence. Listen, we know God. The more we know him, the more confidence we can have in his presence. And the more confidence we have in his presence, the more boldly we can come into his presence and bring petitions according to his will. Let me ask you this question. If we do not pray for our coworkers, our neighbors, those people around us, that do not know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, if we do not pray for them, do we really have confidence in God? Let me say that again. If we do not pray for those people who do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, do we really have confidence in God? Listen, if I have a product that I think works, no, if that I know works, and you've got the same problem that I have, and I've got the product that can fix it. Either I have confidence in the product or I don't. Either I have confidence to say, hey, here's the solution to your problem, or I don't. If I know it will help you. Listen, we, we can use this and say, you need to go tell your neighbor, you can tell your, you need to tell your coworker about Jesus Christ, you have a job to witness to them. Yes, I 100% believe that. But so often we forget the power and confidence of prayer. We go in unarmed, not ready for the battle, literally the battle that we are ensuing. If I was to tell you, go heal that blind man, what would you do? Walk up all willy-nilly and just say, hey, you're healed? Or would you seriously consider praying? Seeking God's face. Listen, you realize what you're trying to do. You're trying to help a person pass from death unto life. Only Jesus can do that. So would you not pray desperately? Would you not pray desperately? Praying Showing our confidence in God. Saying, God, I cannot, but we know you can. Listen, even Jesus, before he raised Lazarus from the dead, prayed to God. I challenge you tonight, pray. If, you're, if you have the routine of praying with your kids, from studying this, I'd be the first time in a long time we began praying for our neighbors again. If you have a routine of putting your kids to bed, pray up for your neighbors. Pray that they would pass from death unto life. Pray. 
that God would give life to them that sin not unto death. We have the opportunity to ask anything of our God. Hear me. We have the opportunity to ask anything of our God, but yet so often we are so self-consumed that we forget about the people around us. I'm not going to say it's not natural to be self-consumed. I look at my prayer life over the last six months and a lot of it is self-consumed. God, give me wisdom. Listen, that's good. I need wisdom. The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And give it to all men liberally. God, I need help. I need, I need you to give me this and I need you to give me that. But in reality, it's somewhat self-consumed. When was the last time you begged God for your neighbor, for your coworker, you fill in the blank, family member? Listen, maybe you are. What a wonderful way to use your confidence in God. What a wonderful way to use your access to God. Let's not forget about the people around us. Let's pray for them. Listen, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. It's not hid to us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. God has entrusted it to us. And instead of praying and asking for wisdom as to how to present that and begging God to open their eyes, we don't. We just pray for the things that we want. Listen, our relationship with God gives us confidence to pray for life to come to other people. Pray that they would have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Listen, there's nothing wrong with asking God according to his will. But there's not one thing, I think, closer to God's heart and more, more according to his will than the salvation of souls. So I want to challenge you with that tonight, and I hope it will encourage you to begin praying for those people around you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day and for the opportunity that you've allowed us to have to come here tonight. Thank you for the many people that have showed up and um, spent the time, and I hope this has been a help to them, an encouragement to them. Father, thank you for convicting my heart and my life about the need to pray, number one, according to your will, but number two, for those people around me, Father, that still have the opportunity at life. And I pray that you would get, give us direction on that, and that we would listen to your spirit Father, that you would point people out to us and begin praying for them. Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to even have a relationship with you that we can even be talking about this. Father, I want to thank you so much for dying on the cross for our sins. We love you for it. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you're watching online, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate you joining us, and I hope you guys have a wonderful week. If we can help you in any way, there's a Connect card. You can jump on that and uh, fill out some information, and we'd love to be able to help you with that. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you later, all right? For the rest of you, thank you for being here tonight as well. Hope this was a challenge and encouragement to you. Again, if you have any questions, anything, we'd love to talk to you, and if uh, you can reach out to us here tonight or any other time throughout the week, all right? Thank you so much. You are dismissed. We'll see you later.